Patricia Windrow speaking once again at uh, the Cable Easel on Channel 6 Viacom. It's a program dedicated to instructing painting and drawing. Today I'm going to be working with a landscape of Setauket Harbor uh, from a monitor, which is uh, different than from working uh, using still pictures or photographs uh, as a reference material. It is using the electronic device of a tape. And I believe in the background you can see that this is a live tape taken uh, on location at the, at the specified place that I selected for this particular study. And um, the reason that it's different is that light is changing as, as, it, as it tends to do and birds fly and sailboats go by and uh, activity takes place the wind uh, ruffles the surface of the water, and so it is as close as one can get to being out of doors, which is something of an innovation, I think. And uh, it sort of will illustrate the fact that I have been working from television for uh, quite a while. Not necessarily landscapes, but with people, drawing people, and events such as conventions and election returns and so on. So um, using the, uh, ele uh, the, the television as a, a reference source is um, a good idea because many times we simply either don't have the time to go out and uh, the time that we do have may be at night. So the television camera is everywhere uh, and at all times. So it might, it's, a so, it's a sort of food for thought for you to think about using the television as a reference uh, source. Uh, so talk at Harbor, uh, as you can see, we shot it on a very beautiful uh, clear day. And um, I'm going to be using that uh, for, to begin with. So let me begin by telling you how one lays out um, a a subject such as this, because what you have to do is to place the land mass and the water mass on the canvas in a very simplified fashion. First of all, you find the horizon, uh, or what uh, passes for the horizon, because there are many interruptions. But usually it's a good idea to divide the canvas uh, from the horizon, uh, uh, separating the land from the sky. And then, almost in a, uh, in a childlike a rendition, place the land masses and, uh, and work from the background to the foreground and then from there on you will know how to place the rest of the thing. This is pretty simple. It is one line across, another line on the left here and another line on the right giving you the general proportions of the entire study. And then the diagonal, which is the thing that makes interest in a landscape. Landscapes because we uh, tend to be ribbon pictures, sky, land, and foreground. Whereas here, when you select the place in which to work, Try to find the diagonal that is going to help the composition. First of all, it gives you a sense of distance, because diagonals tend to do that. And with this simple layout, one, two, three, four lines, you're going to be able to begin the, what seems to be a rather complicated landscape. Actually, what is interrupted in the middle here, and I'm only going to do this to show you the interruptions in the middle for the interest, because we're going to be I'm going to be painting over this, and I'm only showing you the placement of the things. There's going to be, there is a boat here that intersects the sky, so there is one placement, and then there are all sorts of other little motifs going on here, uh, anchored and moored boats, but for the most part, the dock is the only interruption in this otherwise very simple four areas of color. The sky is one area, 
the land masses are, the sky is one, the land masses are another, and then the water in the uh, middle ground, and then the foreground, which is this lovely diagonal. I'll move my uh, ease, uh, palette so you can see. Here, and, this, and, here, and in here is what the, uh, where the so-called human interest takes place. There is a dock, and uh, we're, th this gets done later. Well, uh, in order to do this, um, the simpler approach is the best. Uh, I mix uh, colors on a rather large palette. I have a rather extensive uh, palette of color. The yellows are running over this, uh, running in uh, pretty much together. Uh, for some reason, I've interrupted with this green. That's a mistake. And then the yellows go from the, to the ochres, to the oranges, and the reds. And anybody who has been watching other programs that say all you need is five colors, that's not so. You're going to get a pretty dull picture uh, using five colors. So um, let me say that you should probably average somewhere between 12 and 15 colors, if possible. Um, the investment in, in colors is really worth it. Um, it certainly means that you are not limited to have every painting look exactly the same as the last one because you are limited in color. And um, I will at some point during the program tell you the names of the colors to buy if you are in doubt uh, because uh, it's rather overwhelming when you go to an art shop and you see the display of uh, endless uh, tubes of color which ones to buy. So I'll uh, be talking about that as we go along. So here we are, let's see, um, having mixed the sky color, which is uh, white, and I'm using a quick drying white for obvious reasons. I want the sky to dry enough so that we can be working over it. White, a touch of Prussian blue, and a touch of this Naples yellow right here, and a just only the slightest little bit of what the Grumbacher people call flesh tone. It's a dumb name, but nevertheless, that's the color that is written on the tube. And it's a nice thing that is going to reduce. I'm working on a tinted canvas, as you can see, because the white does really bad things to the, to the electronic uh, transmission. So I'm using a tinted canvas. As you can see, uh, I prepared it ahead of time. It's a good idea to do it if you are also beginning your own painting, because then you can see where the color values are. Uh, working on a white canvas tends to be very difficult. I'm putting this sky color on with a knife. Uh, first of all, the color is very uh, thoroughly mixed, and I never rely upon uh, blending color on the canvas unless it's a specific reason for it. If you want an absolutely clear and uninterrupted tone. Mix it all very carefully before you put it on and um, you will avoid what I call the definite no-no unfortunate smears that take place with indiscriminate mixing of color on the palette. Um, putting the color on for the sky in these lessons is reduced to an extremely simple way of doing it because skies are as complex as any other uh, motif that you might choose, but it doesn't have to be, especially in the beginning. To keep it really plain is an advantage to the, um, to, to the painter. Uh, when you start fooling with clouds and so on, you get into trouble. I'm going to show you um, uh, that application with the knife gives you a very rough uh, technique on the sky, which as a realist you don't want unless you specifically begin a palette knife picture. So I'm going to take a rather large and soft brush and simply uh, work out the uh, rough quality of what the knife leaves behind. There is nothing wrong with a rough quality. As a matter of fact, a lot of people prefer an oil painting to have that uh, texture that is uh, that is that comes uh, with the application with the knife. At, a, at another time, I'll be doing a totally palette knife picture, but that's a different, uh, different style, different technique. This one is to show you how, because when one works out of si outside, you want to work as quickly as possible because of light changes and the day stops and um, tides change, and so the rapidity with which you work is 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 somewhat vital. And I'm just giving you techniques of how to do large areas of color, even though I'm working on a rather small canvas here, large areas of color can be taken care of nice and quickly by uh, the knife first and then the smoothing out 
afterwards. I'm going to have to remix some more of my color, which is uh, one of, and I'm cleaning my knife. And the knife is a wonderful instrument because you can get it shiny clean with the uh, wipe of a of a cloth in no time. You don't have to uh, put you put it in turpentine. You simply wipe the blade clean, and it comes out shiny and bright. Which means that you are not going to have a worry about picking up a bad bunch of colors that may have been left on there. So here is in the field. I've got my blob of uh, quick drying white. There is no such thing as any magic color, so don't don't go searching around for a magic color. It is called quick drying white. It's put out by Grumbacher. It's called MG. Why they call it that, I have never questioned it. And here is the mixing of this color. A predominantly, a large amount of white is used. A touch of Prussian blue, which has a wonderful, very vibrant quality, but it's also very, very strong. And you must be use it uh, with a lot of discretion. Uh, so be sure that you only dip into the Prussian blue with with great care and don't clobber it because you'll never get rid of all that uh, intense color and then you've wasted a huge pile of white paint. This is this is the, the same combination of white and uh, some, some Prussian blue, a touch of Naples yellow, which is a vital color. Be sure that when you go and buy your oils that you pick up some Naples yellow. Uh, it's a wonderful subdued kind of uh, amber tone, yellow amber tone that I use almost constantly in the mixing of both pale things such as the sky and foliage is uh, is vital uh, use of um, of Naples yellow. I think that uh, all the talk in the world isn't going to be as effective as when you actually get down to the use of it. Uh, so that's one color that I have uh, advised you to get in your palette of colors. So here we are, uh, so here, here I am smoothing out the, um, the sky. And even though it appears to be a rather oversimplified way of doing it, it is certainly good advice because it, um, it makes the frustration of having a major part of the picture uh, done effectively but without all the mistakes that are liable to happen. So mixing first on the palette using my particular formula if that's the color of the day. Certainly you're not going to use those tones if it's an entirely different type of day. But for this particular day, this very simple color mass here is all one needs to do to worry about. If you want to introduce some atmosphere in the distance by adding a slight touch of uh, of um, the so-called flesh tone to some white and then blend it in because Long Island has a lovely atmosphere color that in the distance sometimes a rather wonderful pink hue uh, blend takes place because of well the way <coughs> our particular uh, land is uh, located uh, right on the water and uh, that the north, uh, I'm looking sort of northwest at this point because Connecticut is over here. This is, Connecticut is over here and then there's that thin band of the Long Island Sound between it and here is the narrow entrance to Setauket Harbor. So this little, this little um, uh, maybe introduction of an atmosphere in the, uh, on the horizon line is very typical of Long Island. Uh, the monitor may not be picking it up uh, because um, it's a very, very subtle tone. The monitor does show that the color is becoming paler towards the horizon, but it is a nice subtle tone. And by gosh, what we want in landscape painting is subtle tones. You, you certainly would avoid having <laughs> um, dextone postcard colors going. Now, the distant landmass, which is um, n not too clear on this particular monitor, is, as we said, Connecticut. And I'm going to put that in, in a kind of a mauve tone, picking up some uh, cadmium violet, which is one of, my, one of the best colors to use. And it will be, all, all you need to do is to, is to uh, run a sort of a straight and maybe slightly indented line in the distance. No details whatsoever. You will look upon observation if you are ever out in this kind of a in this kind of a situation. You will notice that the distance um, areas are very 
plain, very subtle, just little bands of color. So this, in a wonderful, masterful stroke, can eliminate the state of Connecticut in, in one swipe across the canvas. Um, that's the amusing part of being able to command the uh, views that you're seeing. You, uh, uh, for some reason, uh, on this particular day, Long Island Sound was, a, was an extraordinary band of very brilliant dark color, which I'm putting on as carefully and as um, slowly as I can, because after all, we do, uh, we do shake a bit. Uh, holding a brush uh, 14 inches long away from the surface means that you might tend to be a little bit wiggly. It is, um, it's a training, and it may be also the fact that I have rather steady nerves that I'm able to do that. But uh, introducing this wonderful band of, of, of brilliant blue takes care, uh, just as we did with Connecticut, in one short stroke of the entire body of Long Island Sound. Anyway, um, uh, as, I'm, as you can see, we are working from the background to the foreground. And in that journey, uh, you travel through the distant background, namely the sky. Then you get into the land mass, which is far away, but not quite as far as the middle ground. And then as you come toward the front, the end of the picture should probably be uh, the last blade of grass before in, in, in the total foreground, which is in this area here. And uh, that's what we're going to be working up to. So in uh, a few moments, uh, don't go away. We'll come right back with the, with the continuation of uh, immortalizing Setauket Harbor. So don't go away. Here we are, back to work. No more lallygagging about. Here we are. So, we're going to, uh, I'm now going to be working on uh, the, the uh, distance, uh, the distant land mass uh, with uh, a beginning, the mixing of the colors, working from the monitor. It is a kind of a wonderful subdued uh, green and my color scheme here, because color mixing seems to be a great problem and mystery to a lot of people, that I really ought to explain. Uh, I'm using yellow ochre and something which Grumbacher calls sap greens. The only green that I buy. Otherwise, I rely upon yellows and blues to mix greens. Also, green is subdued and uh, taken, take takes away uh, the uh, intensity of some of the dreadful green uh, colors that you see in some landscapes by the addition of some uh, purple or mauve and white, of course. Um, uh, foliage is a problem. It has to be done in an interpretive way, but it also has to tell you that that's actually something growing back there instead of it's just being a pale green triangle. So uh, the application of color has to be done uh, with uh, texture in mind. And one does not put it in with uh, huge brushes and uh, great sweeps of color. It has to be a deliberate application of color with small brush strokes. I'm using a red sable square cut brush here, which is number 10, I believe. They're expensive, uh, but brushes are the 
tools of the trade. Without uh, the right brush, you get nothing. So to economize on the use of brushes is a, um, a false economy because it simply doesn't work. So the main investment besides the colors, the paints, are brushes, a decent brush. Well, even on something as far away as this distant landmass, the sun is striking those trees. Th that has to be indicated in a nice, loose, interpretive manner uh, with uh, the knowledge that trees do in fact have a light side and a dark side. And even though they're way off in the distance, you must show that. Also, the monitor tells me that down near the land there is some shading, some darkness. So with a little bit of sap green and a touch of the violet, I'm going to darken the lower part of this land mass of this, which is known as Strong's Neck. Anybody who knows the area knows that out here on this point of land, the uh, original Strong family uh, owned uh, most of the neck and has two very important historic houses out there. One of them is called St. George's Manor and the other one is called Kate Wheeler Strong's House. Uh, St. George's Manor is a remarkable example of um, American Georgian architecture and uh, it is uh, inhabited and being beautifully taken care of by members of the Strong family. Uh, a sort of an unusual situation because many times the original owners do not occupy the premises today. The same um, wonderful uh, manner in which you do that uh, land on the left is repeated on the right and there are no shortcuts for this kind of thing you do it uh, that's why it takes time that's why we're going to be doing this particular study in two half hour sessions because uh, instructing painting and drawing should probably not have too many shortcuts uh, and that's why i want to make sure that whatever information i'm giving you is clear and understood and done in a reasonably human length of time. Uh, once again, the um, deliberate application of color is very important. Now this uh, scene, obviously, because of the growth of the trees, the winter has passed, the spring is early, it's coming on, and the tones of these trees is different than what it's going to be in the dead of summer. In the, in, in the middle of summer, the tone of this land back here is going to be uh, slightly more green, a little bit darker because the foliage is fuller. And uh, so when you're doing a landscape, uh, the reason that you must do it in person is because you have to get the time of year, the atmosphere, and the color scheme. Uh, the trouble with, uh, with working from um, uh, photographs or other people's drawings is that you don't get the flavor and the tone uh, of what is happening out there. Now, to be able to make some sense out of that complicated, extraordinary uh, problem of a uh, very long, uh, a huge area spanning maybe 15 miles and reduce it to 15 inches is the mystery and the problem and the challenge. And so using points of reference is uh, one of the reasons that I like to say that this is an instructional show. The points of reference are that certain sizes of things are what are important. So the proportion of the sky here, the proportion of this particular area of land, and then the large foreground area of the, uh, of the water is the reason that one must pay attention to points of reference. We know that Connecticut is a good deal larger than this little band of gray back here in the distance, but they're dealing there with focus and with the reduction of a very large area into a smaller area. All right, let's proceed. The, um, the land in the distance here is, I'm going to use a combination of, of um, uh, Naples yellow, a little bit of raw sienna, and a touch of uh, orange because the sun is striking this beach area back here. It's subtle, it's not, um, it isn't lit with uh, 
uh, fake colors. It must be uh, kept as close to nature as possible because the whole point of this program is that I'm dealing with working from life. And working from life means that there are subtleties as well as harsh interpretations of areas. This particular uh, beach over here that I know of is always a bit lighter than the other one because the other one seems to be placed uh, in such a way that it receives a great deal of shadow from the trees. So I'm using some pure Naples yellow here on this distant shore because it is in fact a, a, a much more beachy surface than that one on the left. Um, I'm putting the color on very loosely because we're dealing with the distance. No details here. You couldn't possibly make out details in the, uh, in the distance unless it was a very large motif. Well, we've gotten the middle ground and a good deal of the uh, distant middle ground done. And so now the thing is to tackle the water area. For some reason in this scene, the water has become much more brilliant in um, than the sky, even though the sky is always supposed to be the, uh, reflected in the water almost exactly as it is. Well, that is a, that's a myth. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that way at all. So I'm, I'm going to give you a much darker uh, area of water. I'm going to subdue it with a bit of the cadmium purple. It's, I believe it's called cadmium violet. And it's mixed thoroughly on my palette here in the, in the field, which is the space on a palette which is reserved for mixing color. I'm going to, once again, because this occupies a large area of the canvas, I'm going to put it on with a knife and do the same kind of technique as I did before, smoothing it out as you go along. The sketch of the boat and the uh, other distant areas here is going to be painted over because we're preparing the water area to receive the details later. Uh, here is uh, the, uh, the three different blues that occur in this composition, which tells the story that nothing is absolute and nothing is a formula. You cannot uh, work with formulas such as all water is blue and all water reflects the color of the sky. It depends upon the time, the day, the wind, the atmosphere, and many, many other elements that can only be experienced when you're out there. Uh, as I said earlier, the use of um, Prussian blue is very effective, but it's also extremely <laughs> um, risky because it's such a vibrant color. It must be subdued with uh, the color wheel opposite, which in this case is in the oranges. I'm going to use a touch of purple and a touch of orange. And putting a touch of orange in blue probably is mystifying to a lot of people, but trust me, if your blue is too vibrant, reduce its vibrancy with orange and purple. Um, applying some more of this color and then dealing with something wonderful that happens here in the foreground, that it becomes very light. Something has had, the wind has disturbed the surface of the water and it, is, and, is, and it is giving us a nice pale little pattern over here. So, because time has run out on this session, I will continue it on the next one. We've gotten a good deal of half of the picture done, which means that that's half of the show. Tune in the next time to see the fascinating conclusion of the painting of Setauket Harbor. In the meantime, this is Patricia Windrow. I hope you've gotten something out of this program. And uh, I hope that the next time you tune in, you'll be equally as interested in seeing the conclusion of this. Thank you for watching, and bye-bye for Viacom.